video, Father Hugh McKenzie and I are going to be looking over some of Jordan Peterson's discussions on the existence of God. And we're going to be considering whether Jordan Peterson offers a new proof for the existence of God. So our first clip is taken from a lecture that Jordan Peterson gave at Liberty University, a Christian college in the United States. If you go into an, an, an old cathedral and you look at the dome of the cathedral and that's the sky, that's the cosmos, and you see Christ portrayed on the ceiling as Pantocrator, as creator of the world, the idea there is something like it's something like consciousness and soul participates in the ongoing co-generation of creation. And that your goal as a human being is to participate in that creation in the, in the most ethical manner possible. So, In this first clip, I think, Father, that we hear Jordan Peterson telling us about the universe as originating from Logos. He says that when you go into a cathedral, you see that Christ, the creator, uh, is at the top in terms of referring to the cosmos and that the whole of the rest of the church represents the world and it is it is shot through with Logos, with mind, with evidence of a mind creating the universe. That's right and he just evokes the sense that the human being who is also conscious is being called by this dome picture, the Pantocrator, the Christ, to be ethical, to be good in the image and in response to this God. You wake up in the morning, your consciousness re-emerges on, on the stage of existence. And what you're confronted by is the potential of the day. This is something that's referred to in, in the Sermon on the Mount. To, to concentrate on the day, but so we'll use the day as our unit of analysis. You, you see the day as a, a set of possible pathways. You could do this, you could do that, you could not do this, you could not do that. And In this clip, we see Jordan Peterson giving the ground of his proof, because he's starting with something which he's just said, everybody knows. And everybody knows that I exist for starters, and that there's a bigger world than me that he says confronts me. He calls this the stage of existence. It is really the starting point of quite a bit of existential philosophy and uh, also of phenomenology, that we cannot deny that we are in a world that is bigger than us, in which we can and indeed must act. And in which we find meaning which we navigate mm. patterns of meaning in reality. We mm. find it there. See, what happens in Genesis is God employs the Logos to generate order out of potential. And every time he does that, he says, and it was good. And the idea there is that if you confront the potential that's in front of you with truth and courage, that what you do is you take what could be and you transform it into what is. And you do that, and you transform it into what is that's good. And, and you have that, that is you, that's, that's, that's your soul. That's the thing that, as Genesis points out, that, that gives you that affinity with God. The, the, the fact that you're made in the image of God is the fact that you have that capability, and that, that that capability to take that potential and to make the world out of it is also dependent on your ethical choices. And everyone knows that, right? Even if we can't... So in this clip, Jordan Peterson makes a basic analogy between the creative action of... God and the characteristic action of a human person, really at every moment of our consciousness. So in the Genesis account and the Christian tradition, God by his word creates the universe out of nothing. And the human person in this phenomenological insight of Peterson finds himself in a world in which he has to make choices, 
and he acts upon those choices, hopefully for the good. And I think that this is beginning, uh, this is beginning his proof for the existence of God, because he's telling us how God creates uh, the unities that exist in reality as a result of God's word, bringing forth out of chaos, out of nothingness, uh, existence that has unity, that follows uh, law-like behavior. And then he's going to be telling us, by analogy, he's going to be talking about our behavior. In the following clips, we're going to see more of, of us as analogously acting in the image of God as, as co-creators. And so now we move on to some clips from a different discussion, this time between Jordan Peterson and Jonathan Pajot. They are continuing the same thing. The world appears to us through these hierarchies of meaning, right? I always kind of use the example of a cup or a chair. It's like a chair is, is a, just a multitude of things. It's a multitude of parts. How is it that we can say that it's one thing? There's a, there's a capacity we have to attend, and this capacity we have to attend is something like a co-creation of the world. So in this video, I think that Jonathan Paggio is exploring how created artifacts created by us have functionality, uh, have a unity. They are originally disparate pieces of matter, but the human mind uh, draws them together into unities with functions, with modes of functionality. And we've had in the previous video a discussion on how the Logos, a god, has created hierarchies of unity in reality. Um, cats, dogs, flowers, things that have a unity to them that we discover that we find. They have a teleology to them. And now Pajo is demonstrating, is arguing that the human mind, human consciousness attending to disparate material things bestows upon them a unity, like in the way that God has bestowed a unity on the uh, on nothingness, on chaos, to bring about uh, organic hierarchies of unity in creation. A chair is a good example because, you know, you can try to define it objectively, but you end up with beanbags and stumps and, exactly. and they don't have anything in common. Well, they're both made of matter, you know, for whatever that's worth. It's pretty, pretty trivial level of commonality, yeah. but you can sit on them. Yeah, and that's they, what they have, there's a them. mode of being which defines mm -hmm. them. Well, and that's so strange. So many of our object perceptions are projected modes of being. And so even the objective world is ineluctably contaminated with its utility. And, it would and so we see there how Jordan Peterson concurs with Jonathan Pajot in identifying that the commonality between the chair and a beanbag is the functionality that mind has given to them. The mode of being has been given to them upon their raw materials, their disparate raw materials. They have a unity, a functionality because of human mind. Um, but then, Father Hugh, we, they begin to perhaps undermine or, or, or fail to acknowledge some of the, the real insight they have on the distinction between the role of the Logos in creating reality, giving the unities within reality, and the analogical role of, of the human mind bestowing unities. There's some confusion there, it seems. I think there is slightly in, in that a chair is a good example of Jordan Peterson says of human beings imposing the unity out of the many. But of course, that doesn't apply to a flower, to natural things, because they receive their unity through higher contexts of the natural environment right up to the cosmos and modern science has shown us that. However, Peterson, I think, rightly goes on to say that the whole of the objective world is contaminated, as he says, <laughs> by meaning and, and by utility. But the utility of natural things is not purely and simply or even primarily given or actuated by the human mind. However, it is a potential for the human mind. It's part of that environment, that phenomenological concept of the world in which I wake up in the morning enabling me to act. So whether it's a natural thing or an artifact, they both have that potentiality. But it's only actually artifacts that have had that potentiality completed by 
human actuation. And in the next clip, we're going to see Jonathan Padre going straight on following this to flip back again to this uh, fundamental phenomenological awareness of potentiality by the human person. And so th th there's a slight confusion here between the creativity and the potentiality uh, of the human being. That is, there's a confusion between artifacts and natural things. If they didn't have that confusion, then they com the, the analogy that Peterson began with begins to take on momentum and begins to hold water. Because we do have to ask, what does actuate the potentialities of the natural world? What does provide what we used to call the formal cause, if you like, of the hierarchy of unities that Peterson and Paggio are very well highlighting? That's the question we're going to ask, and the analogy is giving a, a strong answer. But Paggio and Peterson don't get there, and they're not trying to, they're not claiming they're producing a, a proof of God. What we're saying is they are providing the basics of a proof of God. Because they haven't quite made this distinction between a natural thing and an artifact, I think that, as we're going to see in our next video, they, they go, they veer off towards a sort of pantheism. But we'll look at that in the next video. So we can see Paggio again now, just flipping back to this awareness that human beings have, whether it's natural or artificial, of a potentiality to act. Once you understand that the world manifests itself through attention, and that consciousness has a place to play in actually the way in which the world reveals itself. And so you can you can try to posit a world outside of that first person perspective, but it's, yeah, it's good kind luck. of deluded. It's a, it's a deluded uh, activity. And so in this final clip of theirs, as you just said, they do seem to veer off and they are beginning to have a lack of awareness in the, the key insight that they have made, the insight of humans as co-creators uh, through the creation of artifacts, um, and analogously um, like the work of the creator, creating through the Logos. But then they seem to pay too much attention into the capacity of human conscious awareness. And they are, they are engrossed in the, the power of human consciousness over reality. They're aware that our consciousness affects reality and that, that we are bound up in our consciousness with reality. But there are some, there are some dangers there. Yeah, I mean, I think in this clip, they, they, they've gone back to this great phenomenological, I keep calling it insight, that human beings and uh, perhaps animals as well actually start with a, a basic awareness of a potential to act. What I think they haven't recognized is the creation of a chair and the turning of a tree stump into a chair is a further step in, in actuating a potentiality for our purposes that are not necessarily intrinsic to the natural, purely physical, I would say, functions and purposes within an ecosystem, which is certainly embedded, as Padre is very good at showing, within a sort of nested hierarchy across the whole cosmos. But we have this ability to add radically new purposes for our own needs beyond any ecological niche. And I think that that's a way of taking the foundations we've looked at here that are very good in the direction of a non-physical mind and therefore by analogy with the whole physical, natural, nested hierarchy in the cosmos to an also non-physical transcendent logos that is of God.